word. And as usual, again, I don't think we have any new ULVLCers in here, but just as a reminder, um, for best practices sake, if you have any questions at any point, whether it's about the content of the presentation or whether it is something tech related, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I will be keeping an eye on the chat. And so Maggie, you won't need to do that. You don't have to keep an eye on the chat um, if you are you know, getting going with presenting. So I will hold questions until um, a good Q&A stopping point. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Maggie Murphy. Maggie Murphy for the UNCG ULVLC. I like it. <laughs> Maggie, take it away. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Happy Monday. Um, I'm going to start with everybody's favorite thing, a best practice for presenting. JK, they tell you not to do this, uh, but I have some caveats. <laughs> um, so this presentation is based on ideas that I've been like trying to work through for a book chapter that I've been working on for months and months and months that I just like can't get done. So I'm hoping that the presentation will help with my writer's block a little. So um, you are active participants in helping me think through this uh, in that please feel free to give me feedback at the end about the sort of like logical organization and scope of what I talk about in this presentation. Um, so by virtue of this being about visual art and access and libraries, um, it is in no way supposed to be exhaustive or can't be exhaustive or comprehensive uh, on all three of those things separately, I, and especially um, when you complicate those ideas as they should be um, at intersections of racial equity, inclusion, and justice. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about is through the lens of accessibility with regard to disability, but also um, access uh, as it has been construed in libraries in other ways. Um, and so uh, I um, am focusing on that because that is the framing of the book chapter that I'm writing in a larger book about art librarianship and social justice. So there are other chapters that take on um, those issues in a, a much more holistic way. Um, uh, and so if you if you see, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, places where uh, my thoughts are lacking, um, please feel free to talk to me about that. But also it has to do with not being, um, the the focus of the chapter in an anthology where that is the focus of many chapters um, and then finally i am not a disability studies scholar i'm a beginning learner in the area of disability studies um, and have done a lot of reading uh, but i'm definitely not an expert okay also it's monday and i'm super duper tired um, so i apologize if i don't sound enthusiastic this is something that i actually care a lot about uh, it's just that my energy level probably doesn't communicate that. So four caveats, no worries. Let's keep, let's keep going. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is the idea of access in libraries. Um, and so when we are talking about access, um, the concept of access, uh, usually we're talking about the idea of opportunity, ability, permission, or right um, to use, uh, enter, um, I'm trying to pull up my list of verbs here, sorry. Should have done a better job of getting this loaded. Um, so uh, you can enter, obtain, examine, retrieve something, um, you have the opportunity, ability, right, or permission to do that. Um, it can also mean um, with having to do with people um, in positions of authority or uh, with intellectual or creative works. Accessible can also mean approachable or easily understood. Um, and so, yeah, the opportunity, ability, right, permission to use or benefit from something. Uh, and um, with libraries in particular, uh, we 
talk about um, access to resources, um, whether those are uh, print materials, online collections, libguides, um, access to services, whether that's something like interlibrary loan, um, the reference desk, uh, scanning uh, for faculty e-reserves, um, things that we do for patrons, and then facilities. Um, our study spaces, our computers, um, the building itself. These are ways that we think about access in libraries. Uh, the ALA core values of librarianship um, uh, is a document, if you've never seen it, um, which is from the uh, Sorry, my husband is in a meeting and he's talking really loud and I am annoyed because I told him I was doing this presentation right now. Okay, um, so it's, talk, it's from the um, Office of Intellectual Freedom. And so it talks about the core values of librarianship um, in kind of a really broad way. And so they are access, confidential, confidentiality, privacy, democracy, diversity, education, lifelong learning, intellectual freedom, uh, public good, preservation, professionalism, service, social responsibility, and sustainability. So within the context of this document, um, accessibility means all information resources that are provided directly or indirectly by the library, regardless of technology format or methods of delivery should be readily, equally, and equitably accessible to all library users. Um, and so the statement, even though we um, talk about access more broadly than just information resources, again, thinking about services, facilities, different ways to construe access, um, the core values really look specifically at the resources. Um, and then uh, this is a quote um, from two scholars uh, who are looking at the core values of librarianship document um, and says the statement treats equity and access as economic, political, and technical problems to be solved, but it doesn't challenge librarians to assess or reassess what access and equity mean beyond the level of practice um, or beyond the level of access to materials or information. Uh, it doesn't create space um, for other possible avenues for enabling access or thinking about equity. Um, and throughout the document, I actually don't have sources at the end because I worked on this uh, over the weekend and this morning. Um, I, I linked them instead, but I'm happy to add a slide with all the sources, so like a full bibliography at the end. Um, but uh, I'm planning on sharing the slides later. Um, so the idea um, of access in libraries uh, usually centers around the idea of um, patrons having the opportunity, the ability, the permission, or um, some kind of uh, like uh, essential right to access um, resources, services, or facilities. Um, ALA thinks of access specifically having to do with information resources, so less about the services and facilities. Um, and uh, there are criticisms of that. Um, as sort of sticking to like a neoliberal framework um, of uh, information provision, um, not getting away from that framework, thinking about what access and equity can look like beyond um, just uh, giving people access to information resources. Um, so there are conversations about accessibility in the art world. Um, which uh, have a sort of different look at access. Um, and this is an image uh, by an artist, Shannon Finnegan, called Museum Benches. There are two of them um, in this installation. This is only a photo of one of them. You can see the other one kind of off to the side. Um, and it says, this exhibition has asked me to stand for too long. Sit if you agree. Um, so, when talking about accessibility in the art world, um, the, uh, the conversations are around, uh, around venues for exhibiting and experiencing art, um, both physical places, museums, galleries, public spaces, um, and then virtual online spaces. Um, and then the accessibility of the artworks themselves, both in person and virtual. Um, and I made this handy dandy chart, uh, chart, <laughs> chart 
chart to, to say um, there's not always um, like it's not a dichotomy between spaces and works. Um, but uh, some some of the criticisms have to do with more uh, one or the other. Um, this is an image of um, another uh, work by Shannon Finnegan called the Anti Stairs Club Lounge um, at the Wasait Project. Um, this is uh, something from 2017, um, and I'll talk more about it in just a second. It's the same artist as the museum benches. Um, so accessibility in the art world, uh, like I said, most of the conversations are centered around um, the venues where arts, uh, art is exhibited and then also um, the ability to experience the art itself. Um, and so uh, two prominent conversations um, uh, are centered around the work of Shannon Finnegan and then also a series of lawsuits um, uh, by Deshaun Dawson and others. They're coordinated lawsuits um, uh, uh, against um, New York art galleries, uh, I think over 75 of them, um, using the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, uh, asserting that the um, online galleries, the online, the websites for the galleries are not um, accessible to people with vision uh, impairments. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and open this up so you can see um, other images that I didn't want to just stick in my slideshow. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the Anti-Stairs Club Lounge for a moment. Uh, so going back to this image here. So the Anti-Stairs Club Lounge at the Wasaic Project was the first iteration of this series of um, uh, installation works uh, by Shannon Finnegan. So um, she is an artist um, who identifies as uh, disabled um, and she uh, had a residency at the Wasaic Project. Um, and at the end of the residency, all of the people who had these art residencies um, were going to do installations at a facility called Max and Mills, which is an old grain tower. Um, and so uh, the grain tower, um, the, everything beyond the ground level is only accessible by stairs. Um, and so she felt um, that her installation would be best suited as a protest against the inaccessibility of the building itself. And so she created um, the Anti-Stairs Club Lounge, uh, which is supposed to be in the style of like uh, an airline lounge, um, like the Delta Club Lounge, uh, <laughs> in that there um, are snacks, there's seating, um, there's entertainment, there, you know, there's uh, periodicals, there's, um, art on the walls. Uh, I think there's like a phone charging station. So it's just a really small area, but the whole thing is designed around the idea um, that uh, by entering the lounge, you are protesting the lack of accessibility um, of the building. And to enter the lounge, um, you actually have to sign uh, a statement saying that you will not go upstairs. Um, so you can only experience uh, the, uh, the work if you um, join in the protest. Uh, and so this um, was taken to a, uh, a public artwork, a very large scale. I mean, whether it's an artwork um, is actually also debatable. Um, <laughs> it's a large scale installation um, at the site of the uh, New York City's Hudson Yard. Um, and so it's created by a uh, architectural designer, Thomas Heatherwick, it's called Vessel, um, or, that, or it's referred to as Vessel, I think it's actually untitled. Um, and so it is uh, a series of staircases. You can't really um, get like a whole sense of the scale here. You can see how tiny these people are. Um, so it's a set of staircases and there is um, an elevator, but it takes you um, straight up uh, the levels here to about here. Um, and so the, the work was conceived of um, as something you would experience by climbing the stairs, which is not accessible. Um, and so the very um, sort of conception of the work is an inaccessible work. Um, and so uh, Shannon Finnegan um, decided to 
uh, you know, <laughs> install um, quotation mark because it was um, more of a uh, participatory experience, um, a demonstration uh, at the site of the uh, Hudson Yard vessel um, of the Anti Stairs Club Lounge. And so uh, in this article, you can see um, the, here they're saying, as long as I live, I will not go up a single step of the vessel, uh, signature name date. And then they also handed out pamphlets um, that when you unfold them to read disability scholarship, uh, it becomes a sign of protest saying Anti Stairs Club Lounge. Um, and so uh, this is sort of one set of conversations. Um, a thread from uh, this exhibition has asked me to stand for too long. Said if you agree, the museum benches um, as uh, raising awareness about the lack of accessibility of museums and galleries, which are really um, designed for people to be standing, uh, walking and standing for a long time. There's a lack of uh, seating. Um, it's not meant to be comfortable. Uh, and um, so this is a criticism of that. And then uh, more um, criticism of the inaccessibility of spaces, um, particularly around mobility. Uh, then, like I said, there's also a series of lawsuits about the inaccessibility of virtual art spaces um, and works. Uh, so, um, the galleries that uh, were sued include um, some of the largest galleries in New York, Gosian, David Zwerner, Marion Goodman. Um, and so they uh, are uh, coordinated and targeted. Um, the ADA doesn't actually specify what it means, um, the legislation itself, um, what it means for a website to comply with the ADA. Um, and so these lawsuits are meant to um, hopefully establish guidelines um, that stipulate uh, that um, the ADA uh, means um, that online content must comply with um, the web content accessibility guidelines. Uh, the website's content must be coded for screen reading software. Um, videos must include descriptions, and, and all interactive functions must be operable through keyboard commands. Um, so um, people who have vision impairments very often don't use a mouse, they use uh, arrow keys, enter, uh, enter key um, to navigate around a website. And so in order for it to be accessible, um, it has to be navigable with a keyboard. So, uh, Thinking about the way that we talk about access in libraries and the way that access is talked about uh, in the visual art world currently, um, I want to take a look at visual art and libraries. Um, so when we talk about visual art and libraries, some of our university community user needs around visual art. Um, and so I'm talking specifically about academic libraries rather than like art and design schools, um, fine art and architecture libraries. Sometimes uh, they have um, even more specialized users or art museum libraries. Um, but generally um, we have uh, students and faculty who um, study and engage in the making of art, studio art and design. Um, then we have uh, students and faculty, um, and then also community users uh, for both of these, um, who are engaged in the study of art, art history, art scholarship. Um, and then we have users of all kinds who um, just want to experience and appreciate art for art's sake um, and use visual materials. Um, so, Trying to highlight some of the resources, services, and facilities that we have that support these um, different user needs. Uh, one of the things um, that comes up when you're talking about the study of art is really the primacy of physical materials um, in art scholarship. Uh, and that has to do, um, and this has come up a lot with COVID-19, um, and uh, the 
pandemic impacting physical access to libraries um, is that a lot of the materials are not available, have not been made available by their publishers, um, have never been offered in electronic format. Uh, this includes monographs and anthologies of art scholarship, um, art historians writing about art um, with uh, images of art, uh, then art and design periodicals um, uh, for the art and design industries, exhibition catalogs published by museums, um, and then uh, artworks um, uh, in book format like artist books uh, that are often in special collections and um, libraries and then also um, archival um, uh, materials like artists papers and files. Then um, we also offer of course digital materials and so um, things like subscription and open access digital image collections and then research or resource guides curating um, different uh, information resources that students and faculty might use around the study of art. Um, and so just going back to the physical materials for a moment, there are a couple of issues at play at why, uh, and there's a, um, an Ithaca SNR report, which I don't have linked anywhere in this presentation, but I, I can link to it. Um, talking about the needs of art historians um, with regard to uh, research and libraries, um, talking about the reasons why physical materials um, have uh, really dominated the field. A lot of it has to do with licensing of images, um, that when you um, use an image, uh, when you get permission to use an image of a copyrighted artwork, typically um, to have perpetual electronic access to it, the license is pretty expensive. Um, whereas a limited run of print books, um, whether those are exhibition catalogs um, or uh, university press books, um, will, the license will be a lot more affordable. And publishers um, are really uh, reticent to make fair use claims against copyrighted artworks um, in art history, art scholarship, art criticism, even um, when uh, they would have a pretty good claim of fair use. Um, they, they don't want to um, trigger a potential lawsuit, uh, and so they would rather license the works, um, and often the cost of licensing falls on the, the author. Um, so the author has to pay to license any of the works that they want to use images of. Um, and so they are going to spring for the least expensive license, which is for print only. And so as a result, a lot of art history writing, a lot of art scholarship is not available um, <laughs> as an ebook. Uh, and so this has come up a lot uh, in remote learning on the art librarianship listservs. Um, faculty want remote access to texts that are not available in that format um, because the content therein uh, was not negotiated and licensed for electronic format. Same with exhibition catalogs published by museums. Um, the rights of museums to use images of works in their collections or in temporary exhibits um, don't always extend to unlimited electronic use. Uh, and so um, a, an exhibition catalog is a, a book um, containing the images from an exhibition and then also critical writing about the exhibition from curators and other artists and scholars. And so uh, usually they're only available in print format. Um, uh, as for services, um, information services uh, for the visual arts, there's art information, meaning information about art, uh, for the study of art, also things like um, helping students identify potential uh, residencies to apply for, or sources of funding, um, helping uh, faculty um, do research about uh, grants that they could apply to for studio art. Um, and then also image research, finding images that suit a particular need, finding the provenance of images, um, finding images that uh, fit within particular licensing or permissioning constraints, 
teaching, um, library instruction for art history, uh, studio art, um, research methods in uh, image-driven uh, humanities and social science fields, um, archival uh, uh, instruction, primary source analysis, um, and digital media instruction. Um, then also uh, libraries are involved in digital imaging and then um, description of visual works in our collections, uh, cataloging metadata. Then obviously we have facilities that are used by uh, art students, including um, and faculty study spaces, um, the stacks, which uh, talking about physical accessibility, we all know that our stacks have uh, ADA compliance issues. Um, one of the things that is brought up a lot in the scholarship on studio art uh, research methods searching for sources of inspiration, um, looking for visual references, um, like a lot of uh, human information behavior research has to do with the serendipity of browsing. Um, and so the stacks as the place um, feature in a lot of studio art research methods scholarship. Um, again, special collections and archives are the homes of uh, materials in print collections um, having to do with visual art, including actual artworks, um, artist books, uh, artist files, which are clippings about artists, um, their, their exhibitions, um, their uh, like reviews, um, things about them kept uh, in a like physical file and then artist papers, just like uh, we have the cello music um, collection where we have uh, mu musician papers, so, you know, sort of their ephemera from their life. Um, we have computer labs, uh, we have maker spaces, I'm including um, the, uh, the press in the maker spaces there. And then um, exhibition spaces, we, whether temporary or permanent. We have uh, art installed in the library, and then we also do temporary exhibitions um, like the uh, study abroad photographs um, that are hosted in the lobby across from the reference desk. And so this is um, sort of a general take on uh, academic libraries, um, but also we do most of these things in Jackson Library. Okay, so we have these three sort of disparate concepts, access and libraries generally, uh, access and accessibility in the art world, and then um, art in libraries. And so uh, looking at these places where they overlap, I have some thoughts. <laughs> That's basically how I'm construing this. I have some ideas about um, expanding or improving access uh, with regard to art in libraries. Okay. Um, so the first is thinking about digital images uh, and their relationship to libraries. So it's one issue, two ways. Um, the first uh, is that um, research on uh, information behavior um, with images um, is that users have always wanted to find images by subject. Um, text works uh, have historically been uh, organized by subject. Um, but images haven't. Uh, museums uh, maintain what's called label copy about images, which is um, the creator, the date, the materials used, the size. Um, the, uh, the subject of the, the work is not usually captured there. Um, and so when images uh, were cataloged in databases, um, of images by cultural institutions like museums originally, uh, the metadata that was used was basically just translated label copy. Um, and so uh, museums haven't really had um, use for subject description for images. Um, also, uh, text works have a lot of context clues for catalogers about subject. Um, including, uh, you know, title, uh, table of contents, um, you know, uh, author provided descriptions. Um, with artworks, um, uh, 
the subjectivity of art um, has uh, the com conversations around subjectivity in art have um, dominated conversations about subject description uh, in that who, who determines what art is about. Um, and so thinking about um, two aspects of description, which are ofness and aboutness, what the image is of um, and then what it's about, um, these ideas um, sort of complicate uh, the issue of describing images and databases. So um, as images have been um, put into databases, moving from just analog um, picture collections, um, uh, museums and galleries where you actually go and see the works, um, books, you know, with images, uh, databases make searching for and retrieving images more dynamic. You can actually search and browse um, instead of just using the method of organization uh, of the book, of the museum, you know, of the collection. And so subject access in databases is really lacking. Um, one example is ArtStore, which is the major um, subscription database for images. And all of the images in ArtStore have been populated or originally were by contributing cultural heritage institutions. Um, so, you know, the Museum of Modern Art, um, a commercial uh, photography um, firm, uh, the Getty Institute, they all um, licensed their images to ArtStore and then they provided their metadata. All of that metadata had to be crosswalked um, into Dublin Core, uh, all of the, the various ways um, that these institutions had uh, cataloged images over time. Um, and the subject field uh, either wasn't populated at all, only has collection level metadata, um, has free text descriptions, but there's no way to sort of uh, search or browse by subject in art store um, in any kind of regular way. And um, because, uh, and this is, this is true of most image databases for the reasons why ArtStore does not have uh, useful subject access. Um, and so because it's difficult um, to decide who, who has the authority um, to talk about what images are about and not just of, um, you know, the subjectivity, meaning there have been all kinds of ideas proposed uh, including um, machine learning and computer vision. So um, developing algorithms that can uh, try to detect and interpret the content of images um, and describe them. Uh, crowdsourcing folksonomy projects, um, you know, volunteers um, tagging images, expert tagging projects um, where curators and scholars are um, asked to volunteer or somehow compensated uh, using a thesaurus of some kind. Um, and then another idea um, that uh, I would like to explore is looking at writing about art and performing text analysis because um, the, or, uh, the authority question, you know, who has the authority to say what a work is about. Um, if you look at the writing of art critics and art scholars, um, then that's one way to sort of uh, think about authority rather than a cataloger who may not have subject knowledge uh, in that area. And so improving subject access for digital images is one way to think about improving access. You know, we have paid for the resource, so you have um, the, the permission to access it, um, but you aren't actually able to access it in one of the major ways um, that people want to find uh, and browse images and collections. Um, another way that more clearly ties to what we've been talking about is creating and improving alt text for digital images. Um, so questions of labor, who is in charge of adding the description, subjectivity, who gets to decide what it's about, um, and context, what are the users actually looking for, um, what do they intend to use the image for, whether it's teaching, um, research, uh, their own art, 
or art for art's sake um, carry over from the topic of subject description. Um, and also uh, whether we're talking about things that we pay for, um, is it the, the vendor's job to take care of that open access, um, which are usually sort of volunteer run or things that we create in the library. Um, so again, whose job is it? Um, who gets to decide and what are the users going to use it for? One framework that has been proposed um, for alt text uh, in making for art specifically um, is uh, alt text as poetry, um, which has been a series of workshops by Shen Then again, the same artist that I've been talking about, and her colleague Bohana Kokliat. Um, and so the idea is um, holding workshops looking at uh, artworks um, and writing alt text, not trying to create sort of objective description, um, but looking at the artwork and writing um, sort of interpretive creative poetry about it. I'm trying to find an image from one of the workshops. Uh, there we go. That's an alt text as poetry workshop. Um, and so uh, they focus not on um, necessarily artists who feel like they have a vocabulary to write about art, but um, sort of art novices uh, writing descriptions that are meant to be poetic and creative about art for alt text. And so the idea is, is moving away from compliance oriented approaches to accessibility, meaning you don't want to violate the ADA, um, you know, so you have to provide alt text. Uh, and therefore, you're supposed to write a sort of terse, objective description of the image um, to alt text that is as uh, in the same work framework as the work itself, and meant to be a creative work, uh, meant to be engaged in, in sort of uh, the generation of creativity. Um, and so uh, this is another way of thinking about providing access to digital images. Um, is that uh, in order to access the images, if you have a vision impairment, you need a description of them. Uh, and so alt text is something that's missing from a lot of commercial databases, um, missing, as we know, from the lawsuits I've already mentioned, from uh, gallery websites. Um, it's missing from a lot of our uh, collections uh, in the library. And so thinking about um, who's job it is, um, but also that subjectivity aspect, um, thinking about uh, having um, sort of creative working groups uh, around generating um, descriptions for images that are not meant to be objective, but meant to interpret the work itself. And then um, there are some other things that I've been thinking about, including rethinking access to art with our existing Resources, I put an asterisk there because uh, resources, services, and facilities, um, I just sort of ran out of room. So when I say resources in that headline, I'm also including services and facilities. Um, so one of the things um, that I've been thinking about is the art in our library. And this has come up in conversations about um, racial equity, inclusion, and justice, um, that most of the representations of people in our library artworks are white people, um, you know, thinking about whether we um, can and should uh, commission, um, you know, purchase, look at what we already own, and change what works we have hanging in the library. Um, but uh, also thinking about access for people with visual impairments. Um, some libraries, mostly European, and uh, not libraries, museums, have started um, creating uh, three-dimensional reliefs of images. So um, this is the best actual photograph I could find of the um, relief uh, in the Uffizi Gallery of the Birth of Venus. Um, so if you are familiar with the Birth of Venus, sorry, I'm doing this presentation the way I would be teaching, which is using recall. Uh, and retrieve rather than having the things actually in my presentation. Um, so we have the birth of Venus, a painting by Botticelli. Um, and so in the Uffizi Gallery, uh, they actually have this relief of it right um, sort of below the, the 
the, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, the uh, painting hangs to the top left of the release. Um, so that if you cannot see the painting, you can actually uh, feel it. Um, and so we have uh, at our university, um, students learning 3D modeling. We have in our library um, uh, facilities for 3D printing. We have at our university students who study interior architecture, design, and installation. Um, so we have all of the resources and facilities um, to uh, work on creating relief uh, representations of artworks hanging in our library. We can also create audio tours of the art in our library, which um, would <laughs> definitely be uh, self-guided. Um, we can work with uh, students in composition, um, in art history classes with a focus on writing and communication studies, um, and work uh, with our digital media instructors uh, on recording and editing. Um, and have an audio tour of the art in the library uh, hosted on our library website. So these are ways to think about using what we have um, and working with our community to create better access to art in our library. Um, and then working what we have to uh, rethink access. Um, another way to rethink access is to think about empowering students um, to be able to fully use what they have access to. Um, and so uh, there is a lot of art in the public domain um, for which students do not realize that they are able to use for any and all purposes, including uh, commercial purposes, um, iteration in their own art. And that's because of uh, a movement to sort of privatize the public domain. If you go to uh, Getty Images or um, any uh, commercial um, stock image database, you'll find many, many images of famous um, images of paintings and sculptures in the public domain uh, there for you to license. They're asserting um, false copyright because public domain allows you to charge people for images. Um, but so they're, they're engaging in what's called copy fraud, which is the intentional misleading of, um, uh, of people thinking that you have the copyright or the um, ability to uh, withhold access um, to something uh, in the public domain. Um, and so the public domain allows you to charge for images um, of public domain works uh, because that falls within, you can do anything with it, but um, because they are included alongside uh, images that the um, agency does have uh, copyright control of, it sort of creates the false impression that um, if you don't pay the stock agency for the image. It's not available elsewhere for free. Um, and so that's one example of how education on copyright, fair use, public domain, and also open licensing, um, like Creative Commons licensing in visual art, um, allows students to actually um, fully use what they have access to, uh, both through the library, um, in uh, open access databases um, in our print collections that they uh, can scan and use. Um, and so we have already done this uh, in the library um, with uh, our meme workshops, um, with Paula's zine workshops. Jenny and I have taught um, a copyright, fair use, public domain, uh, open licensing uh, workshop uh, for the zine series, but how else can we uh, apply this idea um, that uh, to really make use of access, um, you know, not just being able to uh, retrieve, um, you know, and view images, but actually use them um, and how you have the right to use them uh, for illustrating things, interpreting them, uh, iterating in your own work. And then uh, lastly, the idea of widening access through audience and libraries. Um, so one of the things uh, that I'm working on now, um, I am on a grant project with the Industries of the Blind in Greensboro and UNCG School of Art. Um, 
a public art project that does pull together some of the things that we have or that I've been going over in the presentation. Um, so I'm going to click on this link and bring this up. So this is a project um, that's a public installation in downtown Greensboro that has not opened yet. This is supposed to debut in the fall, but I don't act, we've had lots of conversations obviously about the timeline given the pandemic. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what is happening. Um, but so <laughs> essentially what has, what is happening is that painting students um, are paired with visually impaired employees at the industries of the blind um, to have conversations and then create paintings based on the conversations addressing ideas of independence, empowerment, and access. Then those paintings will be printed on large banners that will be ex uh, installed on the exterior of the building. Um, Nicole Scalisi's uh, art history classes then record descriptions and contextual narratives uh, about the artworks that will be housed in sound boxes. So there will be audio descriptions uh, physically co-located with the artworks. Um, and then uh, the uh, sculpture students will be creating relief bronze sculptures as 3D uh, representations of the images that will also be co-located with the banner. So you have this multimodal representation where the art itself is based on the experiences of the visually employ uh, impaired employees of the industries of the blind. Um, and then there will be um, uh, work that can be touched and also audio descriptions. Um, so my job on this project is to create um, the virtual exhibit um, to go with uh, these other modes of representation. Um, and so uh, one of the things that's being integrated that won't be at the site itself is also music um, that uses the, the artworks as interpretation. Um, and then also um, incorporating the alt text as poetry framework. Uh, and then focusing on web accessibility for navigation, um, which is something that uh, my colleagues in the School of Art were not familiar with before I raised it. Um, so the idea that the exhibit itself also has to focus on access as a framework. Um, and uh, so, I am hoping that this will also debut uh, at the beginning of the fall semester. Um, but again, it, ha it has to do with the timeline of the installations of the actual works, um, because in order to have the exhibit, I need images of the installed works. Um, and so we are working on that. Uh, the um, conversations themselves between the um, painting students uh, and the industries of the blind employees, as well as the audio descriptions. Um, we also have permissions from the participants, the students, and the employees um, to have those archived as an oral history collection uh, in the university archives. Um, and that's something that I am hoping to work uh, with Erin Lahr more on. Um, oh, and then finally, um, continuing that idea um, of web accessibility for visual art students and faculty. Um, again, this is something that they, um, from my conversations with faculty, uh, they are um, less aware of as a practice. Um, and in uh, the art entrepreneurship class I've worked with, um, that's something where I've done um, some workshops about. And so instead of um, framing it as compliance driven, um, which is the context of uh, the lawsuits, uh, which um, is a context that deserves uh, attention as an ongoing and real issue, but also thinking of it as another way for um, students uh, and artists to engage in the information creation process, having control over um, how their work is described uh, in text, and then also um, making their online galleries, their personal websites, their stores, um, selling artwork and uh, works that use art, um, like t-shirts and stuff, uh, using um, web accessibility frameworks for keyboard navigation, um, alt text, audio description, is a way to expand audience exposure to your work, um, more potential viewers uh, and people experiencing your work, more potential customers uh, in the context of art entrepreneurship. Um, so 
uh, those are my ideas. Um, thinking about the way we talk about access in libraries, thinking about the way accessibility is discussed in the art world, um, and then thinking about um, how we work with visual art already in the library. Um, I think there are ways to improve um, the way that uh, art is described and accessed, um, both within the library and in our communities more broadly, um, things that uh, librarians and library workers can do, um, things that I am interested in pursuing as uh, the visual art librarian. Um, and so that, that's, <laughs> that's the gist of my presentation. Um, basically, my thesis is that we can and should do more <laughs> with art and access. Um, so thank you for sitting through all of that rambling. I saw the chat box blink a bunch, so I don't know if there were questions um, that were for me or were more logistical questions, but. Um, there were not any questions. Okay. There were a couple of comments um, about things you were saying being cool. Um, and Lois, it, when you were talking about your um, a project with the uh, Greensboro Industries for the Blind, Lois said, holy moly, that sounds amazing, which I want to put on the record. And <laughs> um, Brown says, I was really interested in the idea of mutually exclusive exhibits as protest. Yeah, I, I love the, the, the framework, you know, I can only participate in this artwork if I do not engage in the inaccessible uh, artworks um as like a really sort of a strong stance to draw attention to the issue um yeah shannon finnegan is uh an artist who i interviewed for the book chapter that i'm working on um because i am very interested in her work uh and she has lots of interesting things to say. And I feel like I owe it to her to finish this book chapter, but also I kind of don't want to <laughs> because it's hard to um, synthesize ideas, it turns out. Uh, I hate writing, so um, yeah, but I, I think her work is very cool. Uh, and Jenny, I see that you, um, uh, dropped a bunch of links in the chat. Thank you very much. Sure. I wasn't sure if that was the right Ithaca SNR report. Uh, uh, that is the one. That supporting the changing research practices of our historians. That is the very one. All right. Do we have any other questions or comments or discussion? Um, Brown? Asks also, could we host an alt text as poetry event, perhaps a cross cross curricular project between art and English? Um, I I would definitely be down for that. Uh, I yeah, I'm I, I am wondering if we could even virtually get the artists and facilitators um, whose idea that is uh, involved. Uh, perhaps I should apply for another IPEG. Don't worry, I will not. Um, but uh, I, I think that would be very cool. Um, and could even look at things that we have um, in our online special collections and university archives um, that need uh, alt text descriptions, um, have sort of like workshop focusing on that, I think would be super cool. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Support that. All right. I'm not seeing other questions in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording while I'm thinking about it.